With us now is Coach Lori Locus, the assistant defensive line coach for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Coach Lowe's achievements came after years of hard work and hard knocks. In 2019, she became the first woman to be a position line coach in the NFL. Even better, she's the first on-field coach with a Super Bowl championship ring. Welcome, Coach Lowe. Thank you. Thank you guys so much for having me today. Thanks for being here. So I want to get right into it. How did you find your way into football? Uh, I think it was just a culmination of a lifelong passion uh, and love of the game. Uh, when I was very little, um, my family used to attend a Thanksgiving Day game, city rivalry, and then we would go home and eat. And that's kind of just what you did um, back then, forever ago. And uh, it just kind of stuck with me. Uh, nobody in my family was really into football that much. They did it because it was kind of tradition, but it was not something that we had to have on. Uh, and just happened, I guess, one Sunday when I was about five years old, I was watching television with my dad and a Steelers game was on. And boy, something about it just caught my attention and have just not been away from the game uh, ever since that. Um, so it, it, I would say it's a very organic uh, love of, of the sport and of the game. Were you playing sports in, in school at all? And did Title IX have any impact on you? Yeah, so the ironic part of it is that growing up, being younger, I really didn't understand the impact of Title IX, but I think everything that I did was impacted uh, by that legislation. So uh, I was, I know it's hard to believe, I was a tomboy growing up. And uh, so, you know, like skateboarding and bike riding and climbing trees and playing pickup football in the, in the neighborhood. I mean, we all did it. Uh, we didn't think anything of it. But then um, all of my friends, which were boys in the neighborhood, uh, played Little League. And I was like, whoa, I play with them every day. I want to play baseball too. And they did not allow us to even enter the building uh, when we went to wow. sign up. Yeah. And that was tough because, you know, I didn't see myself as any different. I was friends with everybody. And it was the first time that it was a marked effort to say, you're not the same. Uh, you don't have the same type of availability of playing a sport now that everybody played in the neighborhood. So uh, that kind of stuck with me for the longest time. So I played everything around it. Obviously, I played summer softball. I was an athlete in high school. And I think one of the statistics that I had heard was at the time of the legislation, there was only 7,000 young women playing varsity sports across the country. And I happened to be one of them. Um, so again, like living through it and kind of growing up through title nine, you don't really understand that it's something that shouldn't have been granted, that it shouldn't have been just available. You know, I was an athlete. It, it's difficult to explain to a child because you're a girl, you can't do things. And I think that it's very disheartening to feel like it took legislation to make those availabilities and those opportunities happen. But I feel very fortunate that because of all that hard work and the time that was put in, especially, you know, one of my like sheroes, if you will, Billie Jean King, I mean, without her pushing as hard as she did, without others that we're now standing on the shoulders of, I wouldn't have been able to play sports. And that would have been really difficult uh, for me, made my growing up a lot more difficult. So sh share with us how you went from, I mean, you had a whole life before yeah. you got into coaching. I mean, you were, tell, tell us, tell us a little bit about how, how you moved from, I think you started in insurance and then yep. you played football. Yeah. So talk about a little bit about that and then how you got into coaching. Sure. Uh, yes, I am a self-proclaimed insurance geek. Uh, I did uh, all different aspects of insurance, underwriting, production, um, sales. It, it runs the gamut of all the areas of insurance that I've actually worked in. Uh, but it would have been enough, right? You know, I 
I had a nice family. I had a full-time career. Uh, I have raising two amazing young men uh, during that process, but I don't know if there's something about sports or something about being an athlete when you get an opportunity to do it again, right? Like you go through your high school phase. Some people are lucky enough to play at college level. Some people now are lucky enough to play at pro level, but there's something about being able to be involved in a sport that you've always loved and really trying to excel in it. That's different. It kind of brings you back to who you are at the core. You know, you can compete in business. You can be very competitive in business. I know I was. <laughs> you can apply all of the team principles to the workplace, which I know I did, but there's just something different about sports. So when I was uh, about to turn 40, there was a women's semi-pro football team that came to Harrisburg, uh, Pennsylvania. And it was about this time in my life where I started to kind of adopt the why not philosophy instead of what if. And I said, why not? You know, why not go and try it and be involved with it? I didn't I'm thinking on the way over, this is ridiculous. You know, I'm driving and I'm like, dude, like they're going to be half my age. They're going right. to be, yeah, they're going to be like running circles around me. Like, this is crazy. What are you doing? But I never stopped the car. You know what I'm saying? Like I had this internal dialogue, which we all, all do. Uh, and I could have talked to myself out of it a lot mm. on that drive over, but I got there. Uh, it was something that I not only was able to do, but it brought me back to that sense of being an athlete. And that's, to me, it's important because, you know, we can work out all the time, but now I had a goal behind working out. So it made it a little bit more streamlined for me and learning. I, I was learning the game. I was learning the movements, like all of that kind of re-energized me in all aspects of my life. Um, and I think that that's important as women sometimes, especially that we find things that sort of shake you up a little bit, make you a little uncomfortable and kind of remind you of things that really make you happy. So I did football and bumps, bruises, broken bones, surgeries, <laughs> all of it. But I loved it enough that when I did really get hurt uh, playing that I stuck around on the sidelines and started coaching with the women's team and still working full time, raising, you know, the two boys at the time and balancing out as much as I could so that I never missed anything of theirs. Uh, they are definitely mm -hmm. my priority and I didn't ever want to sacrifice their dreams for mine. So as this process kept going, as I kept moving up in the ranks of, you know, high school coaching, men's arena, men's semi-pro uh, showcase teams in Canada and Philadelphia and Florida, like all of that was around my family first, the boys mm -hmm. first, all of it. So I had a really uh, busy schedule. And I bet you um, did. Yeah. Were you, but I think, yeah. Go ahead. I was going to say, I think we thrive off of busy. Um, yeah. I did at least. And uh, that really kind of propelled me to that internship with the Ravens in uh, 2018. And uh, just a quick story about that, because we know how life changes, but I was working full time, obviously going into the internship and my job at the time uh, fired me three weeks before I went to Baltimore. Uh -huh. Right. And uh, I think as a mother, for me, the scariest thing is not being able to provide for my children. So I couldn't pass up the internship, chance of a lifetime, you know, whatever came of it, I was willing to take and went there with no salary, no medical benefits, nothing, no guarantees at all. And uh, was not retained. Um, because a lot of internships are just that, you know, mm -hmm. we want to show behind the scenes, give you some things to maybe work on. And now it's up to you to do, you know, next steps or just call it a day and been like, I was an intern in the NFL, which I could have done. 
But I think it forced me into that crossroad of if I'm going to go forward with this path, it's sort of now or never. Um, and that's, you know, basically what I did. I picked up odd jobs. I downsized. I sold stuff that was extraneous in my viewpoint and eventually got hired that December by Birmingham Iron in the AAF and then from Birmingham, now I'm down in Tampa. So it's been a long journey so yeah. far. Yeah, you certainly, you made a lot of sacrifices. There's a lot of mm -hmm. travel, a lot of hard, yep. hardship, it sounds like. How did you end up connecting with the Bucks? Uh, so Bruce Arians was my ex-husband's coach at Temple University mm -hmm. when we were both there as students. And I've met him, you know, at that point, again, forever ago, early 80s. And, you know, I knew of him, but more so uh, my ex-husband's teammates, uh, Todd Bowles, Kevin Ross, uh, Keith Armstrong, Todd McNair, they're all coaches here. And my ex-husband's position coach, Coach Rapone, is also here as a position coach. So the ties to Temple... <laughs> We're very, very strong. Uh, and it, it's a matter of timing, I think. Um, I couldn't have done this when the boys were younger by any stretch. Uh, but just so happened when I was in Birmingham working, our general manager, Joe Pendry, had hired, he was the one who had hired, uh, we call him BA, BA in Kansas City as a coach. And they were together at a coaching clinic in Birmingham and just so happened that Joe mentioned my name to BA at that point and told him, you know, if you're really interested in hiring a woman, you know, coach full time, I have one for you. And uh, my friend Katie Sowers at the time, yeah. who was coaching for the 49ers, got me uh, Bruce's email address. I sent Bruce my resume. I included the stuff that I was doing for Birmingham and Within 10 minutes, I had heard back from him, and within a week, he had called, and within days, then I was in the car coming to Tampa. So a lot of uh, a lot of stars aligned. Seriously, <laughs> yeah, a lot of hard work too. But so let's let's just take a look at what the obvious is here, which is you're coaching really big guys. These are like guys who are six five, maybe three hundred pounds. What what draws you? to defense. Why there? Uh, well, when I played, I played defensive end. I started off as a, as a weak side linebacker uh, and then moved to defensive end. So, and again, being a Steelers fan coming up through the seventies, um, defense was always prevalent for me. Um, and I, I think I lend myself more to when it was, a, it was probably horrible for the guys. I know it was horrible for the guys, but just the, uh, the sheer aggressiveness of defense and how that can change the aspect of a game, uh, I think that that was always a draw for me. Uh, my favorite player ever was Jack Lambert. And, mm. you know, uh, I can still get goosebumps when I think about, you know, him, like that toothless grin. I mean, there's just, it's something I just, I don't know. It's, it's been there for uh, as long as I can remember. So uh, yeah, having an opportunity to coach on defense, coach with coach Rogers on the defensive line. I mean, I just feel it at home. Um, and I feel that there's a lot that I've been able to experience and be around and coach prior to coming here that has helped me transition. I mean, the guys are great. Um, it's, it's the same. They treat me exactly the same as any other assistant coach, uh, good, bad, or indifferent. Uh, but they've, you know, it, it's not anything that's so foreign that it's kind of like a, oh, wow moment. Um, yeah. yeah. And I think that a lot of people who don't see the journey and they don't understand what it takes to get here, they only see the end result or, you know, they show you know, Jennifer King in Washington or me here or Callie in Cleveland, it's the end result. It's not the journey that got us here. So it looks like we've just popped up out of nowhere and right. that couldn't be further from the truth. 
Right. You're not an overnight success. <laughs> not unless not you at all. Like 13 or 14 years is overnight then. Exactly. Yes. And the guys are totally cool with you there. Um, do they ever mm -hmm. give you a hard time? I mean, in a, in a, I mean, we treat each other. There, there's a lot of uh, good natured uh, ribbing to say the least, yeah. uh, but it's the same environment as I've experienced the whole way through my career. It's mm -hmm. just in a, in a different aspect with different players, but yes, I mean, within our room, there's a lot of trust, uh, with all of us, there's a lot of um, connection that we have on different mm -hmm. levels. So, yeah, I mean, it, it's all in good fun. And trust me, I give it back as much as I get it. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's it's a it would be like the perfect work environment if you can imagine it, because you're all working towards a, a goal. You all have different personalities. There's a commonality of purpose and you hold each other accountable across the board to make that happen. And I think that's why overall Tampa in the last couple of years has been so successful because guys have bought into the process, coaches have bought into the process and you can't, you can't ask for better, honestly. Well, I definitely want to dig into that success in just a minute, but I want to, I, it seems like you started riffing off a lot of women's names now. And it, it seems like there are increasingly more women in the front office and on field roles. Are you, is that really starting to take a turn? Are you starting to see that? Yeah. I mean, if you look mm -hmm. back, uh, the first women's forum uh, that I attended was I believe 2000, 17 and then attended again in 2018 and Sam Rappaport in the league office and Vanessa Hutchinson has, they've both been so instrumental in creating this pipeline for women who are interested in coaching, scouting, or operations. And I don't know that we would have gotten here as quickly had they not put that you know pipeline together. I think we still would have gotten in, but it would have been a lot more difficult to have us be considered just like any other candidate uh, unless we had the pipeline in place. Um, and I think that's been super valuable. And you're involved with the Women's Football Alliance. Talk about yes. that a little bit and what, what its purpose is and what it's achieved so far. Sure. Um, so there are a couple leagues right now nationwide, but the, the WFA, the Women's Football Alliance, uh, is a tackle NFL rule women's league uh, that spans across the country. Um, I was just at the Tampa Bay uh, women's game. Uh, they had a playoff game against Pittsburgh uh, that unfortunately they didn't uh, go forward with, but uh, it has given for years women who are interested in football, whether it's playing, coaching, on-field support, game day support, um, an opportunity, a chance to be what they think that they want to do or get close to the game in general. And I think what's so valuable about this league, and you know, I'm sure it happens in the other leagues as well, but when you have a situation that can provide a microcosm of the industry, it allows you to either say this is exactly what I want to do or I thought I wanted to do it, but maybe I don't want to do this, but I mm -hmm. want to do that. And unless we have things like that available, you know, there's this, there's this big, you know, sort of uh, split because you think you want to do something, but how do I get to the next level? How do I, see if it's something that I'm really good at, see if it's something I want to take into a career or take further. There's not a lot of opportunities. So I think that the women's leagues provide that, but also now like, you know, the, the women that I've mentioned, we feel it's very incumbent upon us to sort of build the career path, but we're building it backwards, right? Mm. We're, we're at this level, but we have to show the steps to the next wave or to the next, group of women who are experienced enough to be at that point where they could be considered for opportunities. 
And again, that's where I think the pipeline ties into the women's leagues. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's, you know, giving women right now in college level, that viewpoint of here, here's what you could get to, but here are some of the things you need to be able to accomplish, sharpen up, you know, put on your resume, get the experience in before you're able yeah. to, uh, to be considered. And that, that really is a win just to be considered at this point, because obviously historically it's a male prevalent mm-hmm. industry. Um, and you know, we want to do it the right way, but you know, they're coming. There's a, there's a good number of women yeah. coming behind us that are going to be considered for roles. Okay. So let's talk about winning the Super Bowl. Do you, are you wearing your ring? Is that something you I'm wear not. every day? No, my goodness. No, I had to get the safe deposit box. So, yeah, um, seriously. What you got so there? So this is, uh, oh, this is the ring. Try and hold it up. Wow. Um, I'm not as uh, proficient in opening this, but it does open. Um, and it does really? show. Yeah, it, it'll show. Excuse my nails because I have not oh, gotten to the nail salon yet this week. Um, there's the camera. Yeah. Look at that. So, but it opens up and it, it has a, a full, um, light, not life size. Oh, that would be terrible. Um, it has a full replica of our uh, football field and the scores from the uh the four games going into uh to the super bowl win that is awesome thank you for sharing that Uh, that that's a big chunky ring i never knew they were that big but the guys are big so yeah (laughs) i i guess you don't wear it out on the town no 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 No. well thanks for sharing that so last season last season was such a heartbreaker um how do you think this season's going to turn out? You got this huge surprise with Brady coming back. Yeah. What's, what's been, what is it, what has it been like? Yeah. I mean, so it's, it's obviously the mentality probably of all football teams, uh, at least I know here, but I'm sure it's common is next man up. Uh, and we've always coached that way because you want to make sure that not only are your starters ready to go and have all access, you know, to, to success on the field, but you also have to coach up the guys with the thought that the, you know, the second level guys could be going in, God forbid, you know, we have injuries, third level could be going in. So everybody has to be in a place where they're ready to go regardless. Um, And so I think, you know, when we first heard about the retiring, I feel like everybody was like, okay, you know, it, it's going to happen eventually uh, to every player, but, you know, let's think in terms of, you know, next steps and let's think in terms of, you know, how we frame out the season. And obviously, I mean, not only is he the greatest, I mean, I'm going to put it out there, but he's also a great guy to have in the building. He's a very calming uh, leader. He's a, he leads by example, He's a a quiet force. Uh, Mm. And I think even just his presence at times just raises the level of everybody's expectations, including the players of themselves. So you don't just lose a quarterback on the field. You lose an energy and an entity in the building. And that probably would have been, I think, even more impactful Mm -hmm. than the on-field stuff, um, just my opinion. But, um, you know, we're just, we're ready to go to work and you just have to be, you have to be ready for the highs and the lows and you have to be ready for what we call sudden changes uh, to occur. And um, I think that, again, in any business, you have contingency plans in place. You have uh, a plan A and a plan B and sometimes a backup to plan F, but you have to have it to be prepared right. and to be ready to be on the fly, make the adjustment and still keep moving towards the end goal, which for us again would be Super Bowl. So, <laughs> so you feel good about uh, defense this season, this coming season? It's pretty strong. Oh, yeah. You just got a few new uh, players joining you. Yes, yes we like- did. Uh, so the defensive room or the line Room looks a little bit different uh, this year, but fully ready to go. Have uh, some great rookie presence. 
have some good vets in the room um, looking to see again, you know, what the guys will be able to put together with the schemes. Uh, Todd Bowl is a master of defense and uh, Casey has been a defensive coordinator and now co-defensive coordinator here with Larry Foote. They're going to dial up stuff that's going to be very uh, difficult for offenses to be ready for. And we're all looking forward to that. All right. Well, we will see you at the Super Bowl. There Thank you, you. Put it into existence. Speak there it out go. loud. Let's go. Yeah. <laughs> Let's go. Go Bucks. Thank you so much, Coach Lowe. As always, you're a true inspiration. Always fun talking to you.